Okay, Colleen, over to you, all the best. Thanks, Fergus. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for taking um, time out of your busy day, um, your sandwich, your soup, whatever you're doing for lunch. Um, as Fergus said, this is, um, I suppose, the final in a series of webinars um, that we organized for International Literacy Day, which has actually turned into International Literacy Month. So we've been exploring kind of a range of topics um, which we think um, bring to the fore, you know, some of the challenges um, that are kind of facing particularly um, individuals, in, not just in Ireland, but kind of across the world with unmet literacy and digital needs um, and um, taking kind of certain themes. And they are also will kind of feed into um, work that we're currently doing and, and intend to do in the future. Many of you may know that the government um, recently launched um, the Adult Literacy for Life uh, strategy, which is a 10-year strategy looking at how we um, tackle this, this issue of unmet literacy, um, numeracy and digital needs uh, within Ireland. Um, so a lot of the conversations that we're having um, in these webinars and, and the outputs will kind of feed into that. I think it's, it's, it's very surprising, I think, for people when they, they hear the statistics about those unmet needs that one in six um, Irish um, individuals struggle with literacy, one in, in four struggle with numeracy, and shockingly, one in two, half of the population struggle with digital. And particularly with what we're talking about today in terms of managing money online, those three things become a bit of a perfect storm um, for individuals trying to make sense of um, what, what are their options and sometimes what are not their options. Um, we're, you know, we'll, we'll he we're hearing more and more about um, the closing of traditional kind of financial services, whether it's the post offices or the banks um, and the move to, to digital. Um, just this morning, um, RT was interviewing Brian Hayes from the Banking and Payments Federation um, of Ireland um, in terms of their, their new report, in terms of what's happening in terms of financial services. And I don't think they'll come as any great surprise um, to, to people today that you know there's been an incredible rise, um, not only in kind of digital transactions, financial transactions, but also providers, many of whom who aren't even resident in Ireland. So there's been a 65% in digital payments um, over the last while. And, and as we know, um, you know, a huge kind of array of, of new providers, not just the traditional banks that the, but we're aware of, but a lot of, you know, online providers, whether people are familiar with Revolut, um, N26. So it's it's a really, really, you know, changing kind of context. And we thought it'd be really good to kind of, you know, talk about that today, both from, from the perspective of kind of the user um, and also from, from the providers and also kind of the regulators. So we have them all represented um, today. Um, as, as Fergus said, we have three speakers. Um, it's not to hear about me. I'm here to kind of facilitate conversation um, with them and yourselves. So first up, we have um, Chris Carty, um, who, as, as, as Fergus said, um, is uh, one of our um, literacy ambassadors based in a very rainy Sligo we hear today. Um, we also have Mike Gogan from um, Allied Irish Bank. We're, we're not meant to be using acronyms, so we're going to give you the full um, kind of brand name, so Allied Irish Bank. And then we also have Grania Quinn um, joining us from, now it's a bit of a mouthful, but I, I always get it wrong myself, in terms of the, where have we gone? Hold on, can, I always get the order of this wrong, the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. So we're going to kick off um, with, with Chris. Um, and really, just to give you a little bit of background to Chris, as I said, she's based in Sligo. Um, and when she was um, 46, which was what, yesterday or today, uh, she went back to um, adult learning um, because she, she was finding, particularly at work, um, that she needed to read more kind of health and safety information and found that quite challenging. So she got a wonderful welcome from her local education and training board, who, where she's kind of based today to do this kind of webinar. Um, and that kind of set her on, on the road uh, back to learning um, and also into kind of further um, classes in computers, maths and drama. So Chris, the first question I'm going to ask you, why? Why did you go back uh, to, to learning? Um, well, I went mainly, the main reason I went back with, I was working with people with disabilities, severe disabilities. I was a housekeeper and all our products were in front of us there. You know, I knew a blue bottle was for the floor, the yellow bottle was for the bathroom. Um, health and safety came in then and everything changed. They had put different bottles, different products. And I got very scared because of the people I was working with and for myself as well. 
I just thought, well, what am I going to do? You know, I'm going to have to do something. But long and the short for this was um, redundancies coming up. I didn't want to leave, like, and I said, right, I'll, I'll leave. And lucky enough, at that time, there was ads on the TV, uh, RT1 and 2, very clear ads, somebody telling you, if you have problems reading and writing. And I thought, you know, the number was there. I picked up the phone and I arrived down here at where I am now. And I met uh, Cathy Powell and everything went from there. I was a couple of years doing a one-to-one. -one, and then I decided that with help of here as well, I went and done computers and loads and loads of different things. And I'm, I'm in it now. Well, for the last two years, no, but for eight years. So it was only an hour a, a week, actually, for the first two or three years. So it was one-to-one -one, like learnings, which was great. There was no one else involved, just us. And um, 10 years on, I'm still doing, I'm advocating for them and, you know, lots, lots of confidence. Yeah. And what, what, what have you enjoyed most about maybe the experience of going back um, to, to learning or, or a particular class? The people. The people in the class um, was like a little secret group, you know, people like I wasn't actually just bad at reading. I was practically illiterate. I could just write my name. Like I sometimes wonder how I be how I came so far, like at 46 years of age, there was so much to hide. But I think like with every disability, you, you manage to cope with it. You know, you find coping, you know, ways to get on. But um, yeah. Well, I think it's just important to know. Chris, and it's something we try and say, you know, to learners that it, it's not a disability. You had a huge amount of ability in terms of, as you said, you know, continue working up into and, and, and your life went on as normal, even though you might not had the kind of skills that that you needed. So just from your own perspective and your own experience, I mean, and this particular conversation is about, you know, how individuals who who, you know, maybe like yourself 10 years ago, you know, don't have the literacy or the numeracy or the digital what do you think their challenges are in in relation to trying managing money or doing financial things online now well they actually can't because you have no you have no you haven't got that ability to be responsible for your own life you want to be but you don't have that responsibility like when i was working i always relied on other people to do something first when i was married and i told my husband he was he was being educated he was doing a big really big job and he was like well my I'm the, the husband I'm this provider but yet I was still out working three cleaning jobs I didn't have a bank account I never knew how much was in the bank and even right up to a few years ago I wouldn't have dreamed of walking into a bank and asking oh well how do I do this or how do I do that and um, the fact that you can't read your bills read my own bills, if I got a letter, if I got a birthday card, if I wanted to write a birthday card, like I have a large family, there's 15 of us in it. There's over 100 grandchildren and 60 great grandchildren. So you can imagine like it was, like you can't, you just, I couldn't. Uh, so there'd be a lot of distance between us. So I'd say, oh, that Auntie Chris, she never gave me a Christmas card or, you know. Uh, the bank was a, a massive thing as well. Because actually, when I was working, I was getting the most money of, in our household. I was getting £124 a week in 1981, which is a massive amount of money. And I never knew what to do with it all. I, I still had money hid under the carpet. But I was able to go into the bank and I was able to put money. So when I got married, I had over five. I didn't even know what to, I was like, £5,000. But you didn't have to get statements. You didn't, you didn't have to take a receipt, which you just went in. Um, but I, when you look back, like there's so much I could have done. I could have had a house here in Sligo. I had could have set up for my my future and for the future of my ch you know children to come. But that money was just sitting in the bank doing nothing. Um, and reading reading papers, mm. uh, trying to see what's going on with the world. Not being able to take part in a conversation was a massive thing for me, because the girls would be talking about politics. Oh, did you see such a fella? And he's only this or he's only that. And I'm thinking, oh, he seems like a nice fella. But I don't know what they're really talking about. Or if for, for nowadays when someone would hear, oh, yeah. Oh, you know, the ESP is going up. But, you know, um, McDonald's over the road, just say, uh, they're giving 200 euros off. And you're, the person is paying and so much more. They don't know what to do. They're stuck with all these things. 
and we were talking about um you know everything that's going online most people like me then would go into the shop and pick up the item and away you go now they won't be able to do that and like you said more and more that's all going to be all gone the money is going to go back under the mattress yep. or back under the carpet or in the biscuit tin like the older people mm. do mine was a lot of under the carpet but in the bank as well but under the carpet um or wherever you could hide it like yeah and that that would be my concern having lived in rural West Clare for a period and that's where the money goes it goes yeah. into the biscuit tin or, and and that's what's going to happen again um so what you know you've come along that journey so what advice would you maybe have for organizations you know banks or institutions to think about as as they're moving things um online well, i definitely think that it needs to be put out there and ad advertise it radio tv it's like um like i spent all that time even though nal is years and years old the only way i was ever going to be able to find them was the tv that guy on the telly talking or that person on the radio and that phone number that meant so much like I, I couldn't go and ask someone well what's what, what does that do or what was in the paper but they definitely need to think about the ones that would have gone into their business and picking up things you know would, was with them for years and now they won't be able to do these things you know like they're going to lose out just as much as the person that can't read and write they're going to be losing out and like i say all that money will be lying idle people will be just putting it under the mattress or wherever or not knowing what to do and don't forget the, the people that have to, nowadays you can't live unless you know how to, uh, like we're talking about budget money. You can't budget it because if they have di different direct debits, every day there's something new, you know, with like the ESB, whatever. And they can't do that because they don't know. They'll say, well, I haven't got enough of the money in bank. But then they're saying, well, I can't do a direct debit. Or I can't go in and ask this, or I can't go in and ask that. The fear is there like that, they don't know what they have then if they make the if someone comes rings them up says you have to pay the bill but yet we're not doing that anymore like you can't just go in the post office and pay that you have to do it online and like me i would have said a few years ago well i don't have any tech i'm not technical you know and they said well do you know anybody no i don't know oh well i don't know we, we don't know what to tell you so i said well how do i pay the bill you'll have to go you'll have to find someone to help you you just have to have an account with us if you don't have it online you know yeah, and I think that's that is one of the big challenges in terms of that transition piece. Um, in terms of you know supporting people that cannot do that, how they might be able to do, but also then how the financial institutions can kind of meet people halfway. Um, because I think the concern is, as you, as you said, that in the absence of transition or intermediate arrangements, the money just disappears or goes nowhere or doesn't end up in in the system and it creates you know security concerns for for people um and and as you say then they're not being able to do the daily things that they need to do to get you know, the best results oh chris i think you've just gone on mute i don't know if that was <laughs> your your able assistant muted you or maybe in your back, yep. Um, pass machines. Mm. They were they were simple and basic. Now you will, you put in your pass machine, and they're asking all these questions. You know, do you want English? Do you want Irish? Do you want do you want to this, that, and the other? Some people get terrible, you know, upset Please. about that. I know when the change first, even though I had little knowledge, I was like, oh my god, you know, what if I press the wrong button and mm. you know stuff like that. Um, if you go into the bank, then I, and I have always found this, any bank. And you go in and you say to the girl, um, look, I'm looking to, to find out to get um, a loan or something. Oh, we have to make an appointment and you have to go. And they're kind of like not helpful. You need someone there that's going to say, well, you know, and as regard as people that can't do direct debits, I think that the banks should have people there, you know, when they, when they, if they do an advertisement or, you know, to let them know in plain English what they can do. And that you can ring up like an appointment that someone has loads of money or someone has loads of land and want to get another million to build another 40 houses or whatever. But they can also ring up and the person in the bank can have the knowledge of these people that they have money too. They want to, you know, live their lives and do whatever. And that they can make an appointment and come in and see them. And once their bank account is sorted out, then the privacy of it, knowing that money is there, no one else knows, just me, and I can go in and get whatever I want. This is what I have. My direct debits are all set up. 
I'm hunky dory. But yeah. if something else happens in the meantime, like let's say they have to change the, just ring up again. Like I mean, it, in the end, it will benefit the bank as well. Like, cause more, like let's say that man, a AIB Bank, is it? Yep, Mike. And we'll he next. did something, and then all these people wanted to come to his bank, and then someone said, "How come you, everyone's going there?" And they said, "Oh, you know, they help people with the technology part of it." Oh, sure, I don't know how to do this either. Well, change over to the AIB. I'm telling you now. Well, that's what I would say. Change over to the AIB. The girl is lovely. She brings you into the office and they tell you all about it and it's all private. And, you know, that's what you need. It's like when you go back to school to learn to read. You don't need to go into a class with all other people and you're all scared and everything. You need to be in a room. Or if you're going for a mortgage, you're not going to bring loads of people in with you to get the mortgage. You want private. You want to sit one-to-one yeah. -one with the person. And he wants to sit with you and tell you, you know. Yeah. Well, loads, loads of very valuable business advice there in terms of how AIB can kind of um, get market share, first mover status um, and use a bit more plain English and customer customer first um, approaches. So thanks, Chris. We'll come back to you later. So it, it, I think it's a nice transition into our, our next speaker, who is um, for AIB, Mike Ogan. Um, is head of customer language um, at Allied Irish Bank for... Um, Colleen, you're just muted there. Sorry. That's okay. I don't know if I did it or you did it. So just to say Mike Ogan, um, and he's been leading on plain English in AIB, uh, where he's been training. Um, is there still 4,000 people in AIB? Or uh, you know, you've trained them and they've, they've left <laughs> with all this knowledge <laughs> um, and make, making sure that AIB's customer language is clear, concise, and compelling. And you always put the customer first, I'm told, Mike. Mm -hmm. So Well, we try, we try to. We yeah. try to, but I do accept what you know what, what Chris was saying that banks, uh, you know, what, what I take from that is that we could do an awful lot more, uh, particularly on the digital side. But yeah, um, yeah, we do. We like a lot of organisations. Um, one, you know, one of our our values is to put customers first. You know, I, I'm going to say with complete hands up and honesty, we don't always do that. I don't think every organisation can. Um, you know, my role, uh, I'm head of customer language, it sounds a bit fancy, but basically what I do is I challenge all of our own communications and turn them into plain English. Um, and I spend most of my day doing that because I have to, because our communications are not simple and they're not clear. Now, I try to make a lot of them simple and clear. I try to um, uh, instill a little bit of humanity into them to make it sound like there's, you know, there's, there's a human being with a beating heart uh, behind the communication because we can be very, very stiff, very formal, very old fashioned. I accept all of that, but we're, we're trying to change. This is a, uni a pretty unique role. I, because I'm an advocate of plain language and I've been using clear, clear communications. I've been writing and communicating for maybe 30 years of my career. Um, I created this role and the bank accepts it. It's made it, uh, it's made it um, compulsory for any of our communications to go through some sort of a filter where I will filter them for plain language. They don't always accept some of the things that I've, that I said, there's always a debate, but we're, we're trying to change. We're trying to make things simple. That goes for written communications, communications on our website. It goes for our uh, mobile app. Um, so, you know, this morning's report from the BPFI said, I think Colin, you mentioned there was 65% of people now using, or 65% of payments are digital. Um, a lot of our customers are now using an app as opposed to cash. Mm. Um, so we've got to make that sort of technology accessible. And can I just ask you, Mike, where have you found maybe the biggest challenges? And I have to hands up, say, you know, I am an AIB customer uh, and I've been a business customer and a personal customer and, and having dealt with a lot of banks, um, I, you know, I've seen kind of that transition um, in terms of kind of the the plain language, even front front of house stuff, uh, you know, as you say, mm -hmm. between the, the interfaces and kind of the branding. But I think, you know, and this is something I, I know Grania will kind of, you know, maybe touch on a bit that, you know, increasingly, you know, the banks have, you know, a regulatory and consumer protection. And, and therein seems to be kind of part of the challenge where the legalese or the documentation that has to go out with yeah. products um, and is that one of the challenges? And is that where you maybe get a little bit of that pushback in terms of, you know, yeah. the work you can do? It's, it's probably the bit, to be honest, Colleen, it's the biggest challenge that, that I face and that we face in terms of trying to simplify things 
is, you know, okay, our TV ads are simple, our radio ads are simple, but the, the stuff that you get when you sign up for a loan or for a mortgage is completely impenetrable. It's awful. It is awful. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is it's very old. So it was probably written a long time ago by somebody who's no longer there. Um, and it hasn't been reviewed. Now, we are reviewing some of them, um, it, but there's a lot of legacy stuff to get through. There's a lot of, a lot of old stuff to get through. Um, and it's, it's, it's all painted with the same brush, which is legalistic and a lot of compliance. Now, I'm, I'm not necessarily criticizing the regulator here, but the regulator doesn't use plain language itself, even though regulations say that you must communicate with your customers in plain language. The regulations themselves are not in plain language. So what we tend to do is just copy and paste stuff from the regulations so that we're compliant and we put it in front of, of, of customers and they don't understand it. Now, I'm not blaming regulation. What I'm blaming is our slavish sticking, st slavishly sticking to that regulation. Um, and we could do more, you know, to feedback to the regulators about that. We are highly legalistic. Um, where that comes from, I'm not sure. I think it's partly history. So yeah, the biggest challenge is, is trying to unpack all that difficult, lang difficult language, but, but we are getting there. We've, uh, I'm working on a lot of programs where we're trying to change the background information and the legal information. And I think that's one area, and I know it's something that we and Nala are kind of looking at, and we've, we have actually just kind of commissioned a piece of research um, in the kind of financial literacy space, which is, you know, exploring a little bit more about the challenges um, that people experience, like Chris was talking about, but also then, you know, the awareness that the financial services have in relation to that customer base, their needs, what they can do. But I kind of think, you know, there, there's a long piece of work to, you know, to change that culture, that way of working, that some of it is, is what we can do to kind of push up that, that message. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. your own thoughts maybe about how do we bridge that gap, um, you know, for customers that, you know, Chris has kind of talked about, um, you know, is it about, you know, part of it's, you know, the documentation, mm -hmm. but is there maybe a role in relation to, you know, a member of staff, you know, that, that you know, is that, you know, customer point to kind of explain that documentation or the services in in a way that is a little bit more accessible do, do you see that as i'm just wondering what maybe that that interface might be is it just about the documentation or is there something else that perhaps could be done yeah well it's it, it is it is about the the documents it's trying to make you know we're trying to make them simpler we're trying to make them more human we're trying to use simpler language we're, we're not there yet i admit that um we do have you know, help, you can ring us up and ask us about things. Uh, if you get a letter that you don't understand, you can ring up and ask about it. You can go into one of our branches. There's always somebody there who will help. Um, we, a, a lot of the people in, in branches um, have been stuck behind the counter, behind a bandit screen because they're dealing with cash. We're taking cash out of some of our branches so that there's more people available to talk to you on the floor. You know, but the simple things like, you know, a couple of years ago, we changed the wording over the over the cash machine because it used to say withdrawals and lodgements. That's bank language. That's not what people say. People say, I'm going in to take some money out. So that's what we put above the thing. Take money out. Put cash in. You know, just to use language. That's what customer language is. Use language that the customers use. Now, the biggest challenge I had in introducing that was internally. It wasn't with customers. It was people saying, but that's not the way we've done it. Mm. But, you know. Just because we've done it one way, that's not how change happens. And can I just ask, and this is kind of a little bit of left field question. Um, mm. You mentioned about kind of language and given, you know, Ireland, first there's, you know, challenges. We've talked about it in terms of literacy um, and language, you know, is, is something that isn't accessible to, to, to everybody, one in six in the Irish population. Yeah. Um, secondly, you know, we have kind of, you know, a, a more multicultural um, kind of community. Have you explored the use of visuals? This is, there's some interesting stuff kind of happening in other jurisdictions, you know, particularly uh, we mentioned about the legalese, about, you know, how to explain kind of legal information graphically or visually. I'm just kind of curious, is, is that something in terms of the kind of plain communication as opposed to just language? As... Yeah. Yeah. Well, g given that um, some of our communications are digital in terms of email, like we, we, we do email customers where we have permission to do so. 
Um, and if we're introducing something or we're trying to explain something, we will put graphic design onto it in terms of, you know, doing a almost like a little slideshow of how things work um, with an exp with an explainer. We might even put a voiceover on it on a vi on video or whatever. So it's not just language; it's also visuals. Um, and, and, and we'll certainly try that. We might attach a PDF which has a, a visual element to it. Um, so we're, we're, we're exploring lots of ways of trying to make our services more accessible in a digital format. Great. OK, no doubt we'll come back to you. I might. We've, we've, we've spoken a little bit about regulation in the big picture, and that kind of leads us nicely on to our um, kind of final contributor today, who's Grania Griffin, who I think is hiding in the shadows there, but now has been spotlighted. Join us. Come into the light, Grania. Um, so Grania is the Director of Communications, uh, as I said previously, at the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. Um, and much of Grania's work relates to financial services and the provision of personal information to consumers, including information relating to costs and the risks and benefits associated with provision of services. Um, a further element of the Competition Consumer Protection's work uh, is to promote the development of financial education and capability. And we've had some good conversations um, with them over the last month or so. And some of this has been done through a number of initiatives, including Money Matters. We also have a really interesting program at the junior cycle level and a Money for Skills for Life program, as well as a workplace program. So to be fair, and they have also carried out some research um, kind of in the kind of financial well-being uh, kind of space. And that's what we were initially going to talk about. So welcome, Grania. Thank you for joining us. Um, maybe explain to us kind of, you know, a little bit about the kind of work, particularly that um, the Commission has done in relation to kind of financial well-being. And, and what does that look like? Thanks, Colleen. And thanks for the invitation to join you today. Um, I think it's been a it's been a really interesting discussion so far. And I think for in terms of our part on this, and like you mentioned, financial well-being, it's something that we've put a lot of work into. There can be, I think, a lot of terms that are thrown around in this area, like financial education, financial literacy, financial capability, financial well-being. And for, where I'd start with financial well-being is saying that it is really it's a health check on your finances, your own personal finances as to how well you're doing and how well you're maybe likely to do into the future as you maybe deal with unexpected events that might affect your finances. So it really brings together like your financial literacy, which is like maybe the skills and the knowledge that are kind of fundamental to be able to manage finances in a way that's kind of good for you, but also then your financial capability and the behaviors and the kind of attitudes that you display as you go through life. And that has a really big impact on the actual state of your finances. And so if you think about how you go through life just generally, and maybe the people in your life, like your family or your friends, you might just think about whether or not you're maybe more willing to take bigger risks than they are. Are you the kind of person who's maybe going to take a risk, buy a lot of tickets, spend your money on that? Or are you somebody who's a bit more risk adverse, who prefer to maybe put it in the bank and save it for a rainy day? And we know that there's a whole diversity of, of um, approaches out there. And that those kind of things, those kind of attitudes have an impact on how well you're going to do financially throughout your life. But the thing with those as well, I suppose, is they can be they can be influenced. And we went out in our financial well-being study a couple of years ago to try and get a snapshot of like, well, where is Ireland? Like, how are we doing in terms of our financial well-being? And if it's not good, what can we do about it? And so I suppose in terms of the results, I mean, what we found is that we're not doing too badly. So just over 50%. So like one in two people, they're kind of fine. You know, they're, they're managing on a day-to-day -day level. They perhaps don't maybe have the resilience that they need. They maybe don't have a huge amount to fall back on if things go wrong, but they're generally comfortable enough. One in four people are pretty comfortable. They're secure. You know, maybe they could do a bit more for their pension. Pretty much everybody could do a bit more for their pension, but in the main, they're secure. And then that kind of last group is that kind of one in four who are either kind of struggling or just getting by. Like that would be the cohort who, like if the washing machine breaks down, th there's going to be an issue or else they're maybe already borrowing on a, like on a week to week basis to kind of make their finances um, last. So that's kind of where Ireland kind of, we saw it set out. Now internationally, where we found is like, we're kind of in there in the same level as Canada. We're not as good as Norway. I think we never are, um, but we are doing better than Australia and New Zealand when we kind of looked at it at an international perspective. So that was our starting point. 
And then when we looked at like potentially, well, what does Ireland really need to bring that up? And particularly those groups with low levels of financial well-being, there was a couple of things that we identified as being really, really critical. And they're possibly things that people might want to consider themselves today on the call going, do these apply to me? So there's two key things that we're looking at. One is people who actively save. So even on a low income, just have a habit of putting money away into account. And that makes a really big difference because it brings you then to our second point, which is people who borrow for everyday expenses. So for, if you borrow for your everyday expenses, that just has a huge impact on your financial well-being. And it means that you're always kind of going from either paycheck to paycheck, from payment to payment. And it's very difficult to catch up on yourself. And for some people, like, it can be simply a matter of how you think about financial products will have a huge amount of this, like that attitude piece I spoke to earlier. Like, do you view an overdraft as something that's there to be used, like an active part of how you use your finances? Similarly with a credit card, or are those things simply that you don't use that you only have for emergencies? They're the kind of attitude kind of pieces that come across when you look at financial well-being and what's behind it. Yeah. And can I just ask you, you know, particularly as you're saying, kind of for that group, that kind of one in four where the, the challenges are, your own thoughts in terms of, you know, from the financial well-being report and, you know, what you're seeing kind of happen in relation to kind of the, the sector and even what Chris was talking about, the impact that, you know, trends in terms of the move to financial, you know, the, the new kind of entrance into the market. What, what impact do you think that and also, you know, the, you know, we don't know really what the impact of COVID is going to be in terms of pent up, be it redundancies or business closures, but your own sense of, you know, if we were to do that well-being report, maybe in two, three years time, how do you think those changes are going to start impacting people? Yeah, it's a really interesting area because, I mean, we've seen huge changes across the financial sector over the last 12 months. I mean, from, from the withdrawal of like KBC and Ulster Bank out of the market, what you see there is like huge numbers of consumers who are potentially going to be making choices about moving to different financial services providers for like a whole range of different products, from loans to maybe they might switch their mortgage, new current accounts. And, and where are they going to go with that? What choices are they going to make? And what information are they going to look to when they make those decisions? So like, that's just a starting point. If you look then at other areas, like for example, the money lending area, like Provident moved out of the market this year in Ireland. That's huge. Like that's absolutely huge for the customer base of Provident, who are by far the biggest money lender in Ireland in terms of that door-to-door -door collection style money lending. And you know, COVID had a huge impact on that sector. Um, it really, really closed down on that kind of door-to-door -door piece and you're seeing instead like a real move into digitalization there in the money lending scene. Now, the main regulator in this area, the central bank, they are like responding to changes there. There is legislation that's coming through, but that's another like really interesting area to look at. And I mean, it does then like, again, bring us straight into digitalization, which is the biggest issue that we're really looking to see how consumers are responding to. And how it'll be, um, there's a lot of work to be put in, I think, to support consumers over the next couple of years so that we can maintain, if not improve, financial, financial well-being levels in Ireland. I mean, when you look at digitalization, for us, the kind of priority areas would be both consumers understanding financial products and then also as consumers move into different financial products. So say, for example, um, the kind of negative interest rate environment. So um, Chris was talking earlier about like, you know, putting money back and, you know, under the carpet or back into the biscuit tin and things like that. We have an awful lot of people out there who simply are looking at their savings accounts now and going, you know, I'm not going to make any interest on this or potentially I'm going to be having negative interest rates applied next year. What will I do? And they're going online for information. We went out and did some research just um, very, very recently to see where are consumers at with investments? Are they investing more and where do they get their information? And overwhelmingly, they're going digital. They're both investing online. So they're using websites, they're using apps, but they're also going online for information. So they're not necessarily ringing up a broker. They're not walking into a bank to look for financial advice. And so then that raises questions about, well, what's the quality of the information that they're getting? What products are they going to? You know, this morning's report on Morning Ireland, it spoke to the emergence of fintech and some of the international providers in this space. I mean, some of those providers have fantastic facilities to offer online, you know, and some of the money management tools are extremely slick and really valuable to consumers when they're looking to manage their day-to-day -day expenses. But they do also potentially open doors 
into like unregulated trading, into cryptocurrencies, into trading apps, you know, without consumers necessarily knowing that it's as simple as like hitting one little tile on your smartphone and you could be moving out of a space that's regulated by a central bank into a space where there's really no regulation or protection for consumers at all. So where do you see, as you said, um, you know, obviously there's a need for information, there's a need for um, working and supporting consumers in relation to their understanding, maybe their kind of capabilities. And, and you know, obviously there's a role for the commission in that, there's probably a role, but maybe how do you see us collectively, you know, trying to kind of address that issue? Because it can't fall to just yourselves, it can't, you know, and as you say, that then, you know, the, the financial providers have maybe a certain vested interest in it. So your own thoughts about, you know, how we can support um, individuals and particularly vulnerable potential customers uh, you know, to, to kind of get the, the information and the kind of capabilities that they need. Well, I think there's a need for a really for a very holistic approach and for all parties to kind of come together in it. I mean, there are um, financial service providers and regulators and those involved in financial education, like there's a real need to, to, to coordinate and to build alliances in this area. Um, I mean, in terms of like regulators, I think for I think when you're kind of going about your day to day life and when you're, you know, maybe taking your money out of the ATM machine or making a payment, regulation can seem really far away and it can you could potentially question what impact does that have? But the central bank's consumer protection code actually sets out an awful lot of, of um, requirements for service providers that are, that are really important. So say, for example, a regulated provider in Ireland can only sell you a product that's appropriate for your needs. And now that might seem straightforward, but actually it's really important that if you go into a bank and you kind of talk about what you need, that they give you a product that's suitable. So say, for example, if you're saving for a deposit in a house, you're not going to end up with a product that you're going to be penalized if you take your money out within the next 10 years. And suddenly, you know, you're going to be punished instead of actually increasing your savings. You know, that you have the level of access and that it's appropriate and that if it's money you cannot afford to lose, that you're in a really low risk, you're offered a really low risk product, you know. Um, and when you move outside of that space, outside of regulated spaces, like those protections just aren't there. And that's where we would worry about people who are potentially looking at trading apps as almost like a form of entertainment. Like we do know that a lot of people came back to us and when they said, why are you investing online? They're like, I enjoy it, hmm. you know, uh, and that's fine. But um, it is really important that if you're doing it for an enjoyment purposes, that you can't, that you are careful about what money you're investing. So there's a real role for regulation. I would really highlight to people here today that the Consumer Protection Code of the Central Bank is up for review. It's mm. absolutely critical. It's huge. It's inaccessible. It's really complicated. It is all of those things. But that doesn't mean that your submission to it has to be. You can send in a very basic submission to the central bank and say to them what you think it's important is prior, what you think it's important um, that should be prioritized in this review. Like the central bank have already said that the area of overload of information on consumers, digitalization, vulnerable consumers, they're all areas they have picked out and highlighted and said we want to address these through this review. So I would encourage people to submit over the next couple of months. It's really important. And then I suppose the other piece I'd like to say, I'd say is that for financial service providers, how products are designed and presented to consumers makes a huge difference. I mean, none of us like to think that we're easily manipulated. Like we don't like to think that we'd be able to look at the information in front of us, you know, and weigh it up and make a, a kind of a good decision. But actually when you test it, and if you take people into a lab and you present different information to them, we do know that people are, can be quite easily manipulated. So say, for example, we've done a few studies on this and we did one in relation to how loan information is presented. And we saw that if you present people with the repayments for different types of loans, and you don't show them the overall cost of credit, so how much credit, how much is this loan actually costing you overall, they're going to go for one with a lower repayment, even though it's going to cost them more in the long term. Yeah. We have a project at the moment where we're looking at what, what can banks and service providers do when they're presenting savings products to make more people make people more likely to actually save, you know? So things like that can be really, really powerful. And so there's real opportunities there for those in the financial services um, sector to make products that are just inherently better suited to consumers' needs and that are helping consumers to make good decisions that are going to increase their financial well-being. 
Yeah, and I think the, the key words, that, you know, in, in what you said there as well for me is the appropriate, you know, and, and it's how do you define appropriate? Because as you said, you might be encouraged to take something that you're, you're convinced is appropriate, but in the long run isn't appropriate to, to your needs. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of the information terms being, you know, customers having the time, the information, the capabilities to to challenge or interrogate or work out, you know, the the ultimate cost or benefit to them of something. And, and a lot of us, you know, don't have the time even, mm -hmm. you know, to, to do that. I remember years ago, Mary Harney, uh, when she was in office, encouraging people to shop around, this was before bonkers and various things, but, you know, you, you don't always have the time to do that. Um, whatever about kind of then, you know, the, the, the space and the inclination to do it. But listen, thank you, Grania. Listen, we might bring back um, Mike and uh, Chris into the conversation. Um, and, if um, there's any, there's no questions I think have come in to the chat as of yet, but I might go back to to Chris um, in, in terms of maybe just her, her kind of thoughts as well in terms of hearing, I, I suppose, some of the work that AIB is trying to do and even, you know, Grani speaking of, um, you know, between kind of the, the central bank and, you know, the work they're doing to try and encourage, um, you know, institutions to take these issues more seriously are you are you heartened chris by what you're hearing maybe in terms of what what aib yeah. is one provider and yeah and and, and yeah the because i i was just said to michelle there what about all the other banks but she explained that to me there but um um uh, mike um you know you said you're trying to, to you know make it right and you're trying to do things what i'm thinking about people when i was back in my time and i had money and there is people out there with lots of money and if they're going to have a problem, they can ring up, like you said, and they can get an appointment. But the, the plain English of it is someone like me, they can't read and write and the millions and whatever out there, people in little towns and little villages that have no access to any of those things or whatever, only the radio and the TV. They need to hear someone saying this, you know, well, if you come to your, your bank, this is a help you can get it's not saying you're, you're you know you could talk about the what you call it the digital part of it which uh, we were saying there that it's, there's a lot of people um have those you know problems like mobile phones are changing every few months you buy one it's gone up to 13 the next time it's no good you're changing it but to listen to on the radio like when i was doing my classes in the beginning and i'd see somebody and i thought i didn't know they couldn't read and write or whatever and then i'd ask them how did you find I was listening to the radio and then I, you know, I had to go and get the phone and you might be able to even use the mobile phone. Like they're just simple things like that. But to listen and to hear someone saying, the help is out there. We're here for you. We're here for you. I think it's the most important thing. Like it's grand going into the bank and saying, making it easier, the sign easier for them. But if you think about putting in your passport or are going for a loan like these people are desperate for loans or even desperate to pay their bills and they have the money at home but the companies is not taking it off of them because they don't they haven't got a direct debit do you understand me so they need to know mm -hmm. that if they go in if there's somebody there do you understand what i'm trying to say it they need to can I, can I, sorry sorry can I, can I come in here just for a second it's jill sure. kirby here I'm i just journalist and was very kindly invited to come along and listen to this. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'd like to follow up with what Chris has just said with both Gronia and with Mike. Are you, Mike and Gronia, both now committed to actually using the facilities that Chris says um, people who are, who are having trouble with literacy use all the time and really is their main access point to information because they can't read and write. Are you both now saying you're committed to actually assigning people within your organizations to take phone calls or to arrange person to person meetings with people who say, you know, we have financial needs. I have some cash. I'd like to buy a home. I'd like to buy a car. I don't not only do I not understand the complicated regulations and literature that, um, you know, is basically what you both produce and Chris, or sorry, not Chris, Gwenya, I have to say, I, I'm a great admirer of the work that you do. Okay, I think uh, I used to do that kind of 30 years ago when I started, I was the one putting surveys together and fellow 
personal finance journalists. You people have taken that over and I'm so grateful because it's been really excellent stuff for the most part. But I think, I mean, I'm gonna be as happy a, a person as possible, the happiest, the happiest personal finance journalist, if Mike and Gronya and all the other people who are working on, you know, uh, clear English programs in their financial institutions would tell me and, and this group, and especially Chris and her friends, that there will be somebody, a human being on the team or a number of them, ideally in loads of big branches, who will actually deal with people who, have, who are really struggling with literacy and I can guarantee you are struggling with the, the nuances of financial services and, and the explanation of products and how they're laid out and all the stuff that, that Mike was talking about. Because for 30 years, I've been dealing with readers who are literate, professionals, wealthy in many cases, and they don't understand this stuff. Um, so, and, and I think that was, thank you, Jill, because I think that was, was one of the questions I had in terms of how we bridge that gap. Um, and it, it might not be for, have I frozen for, for the consumer protect the commission to kind of put people, but Mike, your own thoughts in terms of, you know, given what's happening in terms of the rationalizations of physical branches and staff, and I know you can't speak you know, officially for AIB, but, you know, do you think this is something that could be facilitated by banks in some, because I think it, 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 is, a, it is a challenge in terms of, you know, it is. let's call it the unbanked because of the, yeah. these challenges. Yeah, well, I mean, to answer the question directly, all, all, of our, all of our people who deal with customers, whether it's over the phone or in, in a branch are aware that not everybody understands our products and they are aware that there are people who need help at various degrees with things. So um, they're able to, to, where they can, they're able to spot those opportunities to explain things uh, in more detail or with more clarity uh, okay, when the opportunity going, arises. Sorry, so but yeah, we're- But are you going yeah, go to on, actually, go on, are you actually going to take out radio and television ads? and say, we are here for people who are in this position, you know, who, who are financially, you know, uh, disadvantaged because they don't read and write properly, but, and, and we have left them behind and we want you now to come to AIB Bank because we actually have people now in our bank who will facilitate you, who will meet you, who will take your phone calls. Because Chris was saying, that's how people hear about this, everything, yeah. is aimed at the digital world now. I'm incredibly skeptical about anybody getting a lot of help from the banks anymore because it's very hard to get through. You're, you're encouraged to go online. You're put from one, one you know, website to another. And listen, your, your job is to make profits. And I've been saying for 30 mm -hmm. years, the banks are not your friends. I mean, I, I deal with, I've dealt with millions of bankers over the last 30 years. Some of you are very good people. Some of you are, and we all know what happened when bad bankers were, were let loose. But your job is not to make me money. It's to make you money and your shareholders money. So when I finally hear banks and other financial institutions, and I'm dealing with a case right now about a financial institution who has screwed one of their own employees with an investment, okay? Um, you know, until I hear that you are really committed to this and especially to these incredibly vulnerable people, whatever about literate people who don't bother to read the documents and don't bother to read their contracts, which they don't for the most part, whatever, you should know better. Um, what, what we're talking about are people who've never had that chance to even have an opportunity to to understand and read those documents. Yeah. Um, so, Mike, yeah, as I said, you, you're probably not in a position to speak officially for AIB. Well, well no, and I, I can't, and, and neither, uh, and neither can I make a commitment right mm. now that we will, you know, have a campaign tomorrow morning, which uh, which will tell people that we're here for customers who have difficulty with with uh, literacy or with accessing information. I can't make that commitment. What I will commit to. Is talking to one of my colleagues who I know very, who I'm, I'm know very well, who deals with uh, our vulnerable customer pr program, because I think that's that's where this lies. 
and I'll bring your concerns, Jill, and all of the people here. I'll bring those I'm concerns here. back to them straight yeah. away. And and Jill, and just to say that's some of the conversations we've been having um, with the Banking and Payments Federation of Ireland because they do have kind of a debt council which deals with kind of vulnerable customers, and and that's why I was kind of keen to you know explore with Grania and Mike you know, I suppose, what are those intermediate arrangements? Because, you know, we're not going to be able to plain language everything straight away. Um, there, you know, the pace of change is happening so quickly. And as Chris really eloquently pointed out, you know, we are going to end up with a situation that, you know, more people are not going to be able to engage with that. They're going to be left behind. They're not going to be able to, you know, to feel comfortable or be able to kind of, you know, function fine financially and and money will end up kind of um you know going back into the biscuit tin so i think we do have to find really practical solutions around this um just wondering is there anybody else um that might have a question or a comment that they'd like can to... i just say something sure chris yep. not only will this money you know go back onto the thing but the fact that their mental health will suffer, like like Jill said. They want to buy a car. A simple thing like buying a car, not being mm. able to tax it and insure it. I know that's not to do with the bank, but mm. this money is not going to be working for them. You know, they, they might be to have all that money, buy whatever they want, but they can't. They haven't got the confidence. They don't have the information. They don't have, you know, and that's where the banks come in and that th there's their money stuck yeah. on their yeah. mattress or wherever for years and, and, and years. And, and that's, you know, that the whole piece of, you know, the, the concern is that, you know, if people can't um, engage, they become isolated, they become excluded, you know, from, yeah, and you talked about it, Chris, in terms of even, you know, not being able to send that postcard or that communion card to, um, you know, a, a grandchild, you know, and people further retreat. And that's, you know, what we're trying to kind of work against to ensure that, you know, people, you know, have the, the access to those services or functions or, you know, opportunities, you um, with with the basic kind of literacy numeracy and digital skills i know we're kind of coming close to the end just wondering does anybody have another i maybe... wonder could i just pop in there for a second sure. just to say that we do have a helpline and i think sometimes when people think of consumer protection they don't necessarily think of consumer protection in the financial services space but we have a helpline that provides information on personal finance queries and people do get in touch with for example like we have, a, we have quite a number of older people who've been in touch this year with questions around equity release products and what do they mean and what are my rights and all of that. So our helpline is there for anyone to call it. It's 01-402-5555. Um, but also we do have um, a range of campaigns out. Now they do tend to be quite specific on various things. So I think we've just gone out in mortgages this week on rights around that. We've had more general campaigns earlier in the year. But we will be back in January with another series of how to be good with money on RTE. It's with Owen McKee, McGee, where he works through various, um, you know, different households and looks at their um, looks at their experiences and managing their finances and how they can reach different goals by maybe doing it differently. And if there is anybody in different like, organizations or anything who's on this call who'd like to work with us to maybe um, use how to be good at money within their own groups or to have supporting materials, like please do get in touch because we do think it's a really accessible way of reaching people um, across the country. Uh, and we're always very keen to, to do anything we can around it. We also do have a network of financial advisors around the country. I'd love to say we offer them out for one-to-one -one sessions. I'm afraid we just don't. We don't have the resources, but they will come into any, any employment, any workspace, any community group and do a session with the group to talk through some of the kind of key points of financial management. And if you have a particular inter interest in pensions, maybe if, if it's kind of an older group in your workplace or if you have particular interest in maybe savings, you can let us know and they will adapt the presentation and the training session for to meet your needs. So um, we do really encourage people to kind of make use of any of those supports if they if they suit you. And, and Grania, that, that may, as, as the strategy, the 10 year strategy that I mentioned is rolling out, that might be really, you know, a, a good opportunity for collaboration because there's meant to be kind of regional kind of coalitions set up around the country and, you know, based kind of through the education and training boards. Um, and, and it might be kind of an opportunity, you know, to link in, in with those. Angela, I think, is looking for Grania's um, email just to follow up. So we'll, we'll connect the two of you after the, the, the webinar. Um, but I, I think as well um, that there is kind of those kind of opportunities to kind of say, as you say, Grandi, there, there is support out there. I think one, one of the challenges we have is that all of us are continuously bombarded mm -hmm. 
with information um, and opportunities and messaging. And, and, like, and we're even seeing with kind of, you know, the government just ran a lot of radio ads um, in conjunction with the strategy and they're not necessarily getting the same pickup. And, you know, recent research as part of the strategy says sometimes people aren't connecting with that those TV and radio ads anymore. So I think, you know, we, once again, we have to look really kind of creatively and I think locally um, in terms of, you know, Chris, you heard a radio ad, but sometimes I think people aren't listening as much anymore because they're just so bombarded with doom and gloom on, on radio and TV. Um, so we are going to have to look at new ways of kind of getting, getting the message out to people that the support is there. Um, but, you know, Chris, you had the courage to kind of take that first step in um, and, and, you know, take the money out from the biscuit tin and go in. But, you know, it's encouraging more people to kind of, you know, cross the threshold, whether it is of, you know, a local bank or a post office or, or wherever to, to start a conversation. Just wondering, any anybody else? Last, last burning question might want to push to the panelists. Well, Chris or Mike, a, a final word of observation, hope, suggestion, ambition well, for know, the future. I know, I know. I'm. I'd rather be with the credit union than the bank because I always Good find them. You know, um, even my own bank where I am now, I I tried over the years to gas for help and. There are, now this new thing came in, you know, if you were to go to the desk and they, they have that, that thing, the online banking, and like I needed a three month statement for something uh, for, for the credit union, actually, to get a new shower. And uh, she said, oh, do you have online banking? I said, no. And she said, well, I can show you, but not now. We'd have to come back. And then I came back and she just, I said, can you make the appointment? No, she said, I can't. She said, do you have anyone else who can help you? So even at that, like, you know, yeah, the yeah. online bank and you know, yes. but I'd rather be with the credit union because actually, I Chris, I think you've made with... Chris, you've made a good choice going to your credit union. It has been consistently yeah. I mean, I, I, the best friend for people, both in rural Ireland and in in the cities, and people who need more personal contact. Um, I think and, you've made a very good choice. They're, they're mm. going to be doing Jill. They're going to be doing direct debits and all that as well. So oh, I'm going many to of them do. Many yeah. of them completely do. Completely change over to them and. Like I know I was afraid of a few times and um, I had to say, well, look, I, I don't know how to fill in the form. I wanted to borrow 500 euro. And she said, oh, you have to fill in this form and I said, can I bring it home? And she said, well, you can, but you fill it here, it's quicker. And I said, look, I can't read the right. And she was lovely. She just said, don't worry. Of course she was. Yeah, of course she was. Mm-hmm. You can't say that in the bank. Like, they're like, oh, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It's customers here with money and they're waiting to be. <laughs> so, you know. Right. Well, I'm sorry you had that experience. Yeah, but, that's, well, that's just say. one. That's me, just one, yeah. one of me. Yeah. And can yeah. imagine, but know, I, and, well, and I think well, we I, all have the experiences, say- yeah, of of uh, you know maybe not the the same responsive service we, we we would like. But I think, and I think this is you know part of the challenge we're all facing in terms of um you know the world is getting faster. Um, and how you know do we we access services you know as we need them, and and particularly then how do we support maybe you know those um members of our society that that need a little bit extra help um and but you know meeting people where Claudia, they need I'm it sorry a bigger pardon also you were mm. saying that did people you know don't li- listen but in actual fact there's more people listening to things than you would imagine like you know the radio and the tv be still my first choice yeah you know for information even now so you know. No, I, I agree with you. And I think that that would be my, my view as well in terms of, you know, particularly local radio in Ireland has, has tremendous reach. But it, it's just been interesting, even from, say, what we've seen in the last year, that maybe the response wouldn't have been as, as great as it would have been a couple of years ago. So it, and that might just be kind of a little bit of a blip. But uh, I think it, it, it we're constantly having to look. And that's why I was asking Mike as well about maybe the power of visuals and, and new, you know, new ways of kind of you know, communicating mm-hmm. to people and, yeah. you know, putting those those messages in front of them. OK, did anybody any of the speakers one last any any last words of wisdom before we wrap up for the day? I think it was been you know it's been a really, you know, I think really thought provoking um, and kind of challenging kind of conversation. I think it's the start of many um, more communications in this space, particularly for us. As I said, we're um, embarking on a piece of research in relation to kind of financial literacy as well as numeracy. So I, I hope that we'll be able to return to this topic um, and, and and see where we are maybe in a few months or even a, a year's time. Does, does our chief um, housekeeper want to come in and say anything 
Any last words, Fergus, or will I, will I wrap um, up? Just to thank all the speakers, because yeah. it was fantastic. Yeah, it was it was great. And thank you for the, the time that everybody gave to it. And, you know, the willingness to I, I deviated from questions a bit as well that we had agreed beforehand. But I think we had a really good um, conversation. And, and thanks to Jill um, for her pleasure during the pot, which is always which is always <laughs> great. Um, OK, folks, well, listen, thanks so much for your thanks attention everybody. and time. Thank you. And we look forward to chatting sure. with you thank again. You. Regards to all. Thanks, Grania. Thanks, Bye. Mike. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Thank Bye. you.